Uh, so here he is in the garden of his uh, last studio, which is much more commodious and near the famous palace of Schönbrunn. And he's wearing his uh, very characteristic blue smock. Don't think there was much underneath it for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, the blue is important because it comes from William Morris and Burne Jones, two artists that Gustav Klimt very much admired. And Morris had spent years perfecting his indigo blue discharge dye and habitually wore a blue shirt, as did Burne Jones. And I suppose by 1900, it had become almost a mark of being an artist wearing this distinctive blue colour. And then the other image is of Gustav Klimt is by Egon Schiele, already exhibiting his very distinctive style, particularly those very expressive hands. But Klimt and Schiele are very much a product of their era, not just of the Vienna Secession, but also of the Vienna of Sigmund Freud. Sometimes when I'm studying these two artists, I don't know which comes first, uh, Freud, or Klimt and Egon Schiele in terms of their psychological uh, problems. Most importantly, Gustav Klimt becomes a leader of the secession in mid-life. He's born in 1862. So when he leads the secession artists out in 1897, um, he is already at the height of his career, a very well established artist. So he bucks a trend, I suppose you could put it, in that he's not an enfant terrible. He has a complete vault face, a mid-life crisis, if you like, and switches really from an academic commercial modus operandi um, into becoming the leader of the avant-garde. On the other hand, Egon Schiele is your classic, in fact, enfant terrible. Uh, born in 1890, he dies in 1918, so his career is barely 10 years, uh, from 1909 to 1918. And uh, my poster, of course, is to show you that I have not misspelled secession, um, because, of course, it's derived from to secede or to break away. And we only have one or two secessions, although they are very clearly related to Art Nouveau and Jugendstil, which are the new art movements of the 1890s. But a secession is when you specifically or deliberately break away from a well-established institution. And in the case of Vienna, that institution is the Society of Austrian Artists, somewhat equivalent to uh, the Royal Academy. In fact, Vienna was a very conventional place. Here is a section of the Hofburg, which I think many of you uh, might uh, recognize. And Franz Josef, who, like Queen Victoria's, was one of, one of the longest reigning monarchs, uh, Franz Josef does not die until the middle of the First World War. He did not really feel comfortable with either secession architecture or secession artists. He much preferred the Maria Theresa style, uh, which essentially is mid-18th century and exemplified by the Hofburg and also uh, by Schönbrunn itself. However, we have a rebel in our midst, and I think the story or the life of Sisi, the Empress Elizabeth, very much highlights the undercurrents of Vienna society at the end of the 19th century. She's very beautiful. She's from Munich. You could see her a bit as a Princess Diana. She doesn't really understand or fit into the strict codes of the Austrian court, and she is a bit of a clothes horse because of her famous waist, which was only 18 inches. You see her here at the height of her beauty, uh, painted by Winterhalter. And in the late 1890s, she will be assassinated by an anarchist. And I think her difficulties, both uh, functioning within the Austrian court and then her very sad assassination, sort of highlights some of the complexities and difficulties of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the run up to the First World War. So here are the leading figures in the secession. So in 1897, they will break away from the Society or Association of Austrian Artists and form their own group with essentially Gustav Klimt as their leader. The younger generation that he leads includes Coleman Moser, who you see down the bottom here with his distinctive moustache, and Josef Hoffmann, and they will be instrumental in founding the Wiener Werkstätte. More on that later. 
Josef Maria Albrecht was at this stage in his career um, sort of second in command to Otto Wagner, who was the leading architect uh, in Vienna and was doing his best to transform Vienna into what you and I might call the city beautiful. Clint here photographed in that blue smock again, but with his cat. Uh, Egon Schiele over here, Oshka Koshka, who survives the cataclysm of the flu epidemic of 1918, will move to Berlin and become a stalwart of the avant-garde there and does not die, as you can see, until 1980. And then Adolf Luce, who is often seen to be one of the most important uh, precursors of the modernist movement, which flourishes during the interwar period. So these are the key figures in the of Vienna secession. Coleman Moser dies in 1918, but he's actually is from the flu, he dies from cancer. Otto Wagner also dies in 1918. So very obviously 1918 with the death of Klimt and Egon Schiele sort of marks the end of our golden age uh, in Vienna. And I think this golden age has become particularly popular over the last few years, not just because of the antics of Sheila and Gustav Klimt, but also because of the famous uh, film, uh, The Woman in Gold and the book, but also The Hair with the Amber Eyes, uh, which gain highlights uh, one of the sensitive issues in our story, in that many of Klimt's clientele were haute bourgeois Jewish industrialists. And that's going to be, I'm afraid, a key part of our story in terms of the survival of Clint's paintings and their repatriation to their original uh, Jewish owners, as in the case of the woman in gold, a.k.a. Adele Block Bauer. So this is just to, to show you uh, that uh, in the 1880s, Clint's style was pretty conventional, very much in the academic style. If I didn't tell you that this was Gustav Klimt, you might think that it was by Lawrence Alma Tadema, who was also creating very similar neoclassical um, imagery. She's a perfect nude, and she is surrounded by quotations from antiquity, particularly the boy at taking the thorn from his foot, um, probably not the Elgin marbles at the top, but something very similar, the frieze. It's very much an homage to neoclassical sculpture. And this dates to 1889. But by 1901, we have uh, the complete antithesis of this academic style, because by 1903, Klimt was firmly allied to the avant-garde, and he had abandoned what he referred to as commercial art in order to forge a completely individual path, one that was not really driven by these uh, very conservative institutions. So hope number one was a real slap in the face of the Austrian public. It was completely forbidden to depict uh, pregnant women, and certainly not naked women. As you can see, uh, For if I flip back again, she is depicted as nature intended. And she is surrounded, as you can see, by what appears to be a primordial soup. There's a very large monster here in the water. And then in the, at the top here, we have madness, death, famine. We have all the ills in the world, which hopefully hope will overcome. So how did this amazing shift in Gustav Klimt's career, how did it occur? Well, he was not born with a silver spoon, that's for sure. He is uh, born into a family of seven, and his brothers, Ernst and Georg, will also follow him into the art world. His younger sisters, uh, Clara and Hermine, never marry, and in fact, one of the reasons that academics argue that, that Klimt is emotionally uh, stunted is that he is very much a mother's boy. He will live with his mother and his two sisters and she, until she dies. And she doesn't die until about 1915, 1916. And he never seems to be able to form really fully meaningful relationships with women, as you'll see. So uh, his parents are really hard up but they realized that their son has a talent. And fortunately, they had a system in Vienna where if you passed a certain number of exams, you would get a free tuition. 
So between 1876 and 78, we find the young Clint uh, studying at the School of Applied Arts of the Imperial Royal Museum of Austrian Art and Industry, otherwise now today known as the MAC. This was very like the V&A, so it was a collection of exemplary objects which were designed to teach workers the very best examples of the past. It, but it also had a school attached, and the school was fundamentally designed to teach artisans. If you went to the uh, School of Applied Arts, you weren't expected to then graduate to the Fine Arts Academy. You were expected to more likely move into industry, like ceramics or glass, or to become a teacher. And that was essentially uh, the young Gustav Klintz at goal. He was followed into the School of Applied Arts by his younger brother, Ernst, who will join him in the company of artists alongside Franz Match. And you can see them, all little group of them down the bottom here. Um, it, they're all sort of about the same sort of age. And uh, eventually Georg, that's the third brother, will also join, well, will also go through the same course of education, uh, joining the Applied Arts, and he'll become a metal worker. So they obviously had the artistic gene, if I can put it that way. Clint was very lucky because he was discovered by the wonderfully named Professor Laufberg. Now, um, it's, he's described as his protégé, but I also sort of rather feel that Laufberg rather exploited Clint's talents as he used him to complete several major projects, including this, the famous Minerva Fountain. Just underneath that wooden cladding down the bottom um, is the fountain. But most importantly, this is Minerva. So this idea of taking Minerva, goddess of war and the arts, alongside her attribute, her rather lovely owl down the bottom there, is one of the reasons why Minerva will be taken up by the secession when they go to war against commercial arts and bourgeois complacency. Their words, not mine. The company of artists, which included or was in fact uh, around this little group of three artists, so we have Gustav Klimt, Ernst Klimt, his brother, and Franz Match. They work as a group of decorators. They get very prestigious commissions in the provinces. They travel all over the Austro-Hungarian uh, territories, decorating primarily theatres. They are then called or given the, the, the boost of getting a commission in Vienna itself for the Berg Theatre, a brand new theatre on the ring. And I'm showing you here one of the staircases which miraculously survived uh, the bombing at the end of the Second World War. And if you're going to Vienna and you want to do the sort of full homage to Gustav Klimt, uh, this is definitely a high on your priorities because it's one of the few places that you'll actually see a portrait, not only of Gustav, but also of Ernst. So here we are, the uh, theme of the decoration of the Berg Theatre was the history of theatre. So we're looking here at a production in the Globe Theatre and Klimt, who you see here with the ruff, and Ernst Klimt and Franz Match are part of the audience. So it's very, he's, Clint, there's photographs of him, but he's complete antithesis again uh, to Egon Schiele, who did hundreds of self-portraits as a form of self-examination. We don't have many letters by Gustav Clint. We only have a handful of postcards to Emily Floger. And he preferred the telephone. Of course, that's rather difficult nowadays to fall back on. Having had this uh, great success uh, with the decoration of the Berg Theatre, the company of artists, the Clipped Brothers and Franz Match, are called upon to decorate the staircase of the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Again, this was a very prestigious commission, but it was also very difficult. They were following in the footsteps of Hans Mackart, who is the great artist decorator in Vienna, who had just recently died. Even more problematic was the ceiling, which you can't quite see here, which had been given to a very famous Hungarian artist by the name of Mukashe. So what the company of artists were left with were these rather difficult spandrels that you're looking at here. This walkway to see them was erected in 2012 for the big uh, 150 year celebration of the birth of Gustav Klimt. And it was also re-erected in 2018, when, of course, we were marking the death, not only of Gustav Klimt, 
Virgil so Egon Schiele. A, a close-up of the two spangles here, showing Athena Minerva on the left, and on this side, uh, Egypt. It's just to highlight that, again, this uh, whole scheme was to tell the whole history of art in condensed form. And uh, you're going to see as we go through that there's quite an influence from Egyptian arts on Gustav Klimt's emerging style, particularly when we get to the so-called golden phase, i.e. the kiss. <clears throat> Helena Floger, and I've mentioned already um, Emily Floger, who is Gustav Klimt's life partner, and they are brother and sister-in-law. So Helena, you see here, was the model for the German Renaissance. And in 1891, she marries Ernst Klimt, and they have a daughter, also Helena. But very sadly, at the end of 1892, the very young Ernst Klimt, he's not yet 30, uh, dies in a flu epidemic. And so uh, Gustav Klimt finds himself um, essentially guardian to the baby Helena and really a sort of guardian to the entire uh, Floger family. And his relationship to Emily has always caused a lot of consternation because we don't really understand why Gustav Klimt never married her. She is his lifelong partner and the one person that he calls for on his deathbed um, is Millie or Emily at Floger. This is on the right hand side is by Ernst Klimt, but it's the story that's important. It's the story of Paolo and Francesca who are brother and sister-in-law who fall in love with each other. And that's essentially the story of Emily Floger and Gustav Klimt. They are brother and sister-in-law. More of that later. So having had this uh, wonderful start in the commercial uh, decorative arts world alongside his brother, when his brother dies in 1892, this seems to create almost a psychotic or psychic break in addition to that, his father dies in the same year uh, from a stroke. So you could say that Clint suffers in the mid-1890s a midlife crisis. His style changes completely. He moves away from that Alma Tadema type of academic uh, painting with its rigid outlines and precision to a style that I often equate with that of James McNeil Whistler who was at the height of his fame uh, in the 1890s. Whistler dies in 1903. Love of 1895 points the way forward. And I've got next to it Whistler's much earlier symphony in flesh, colour and pink, which is actually a portrait of Mrs. Frederick Leyland to show you what I mean about the sort of Whistlerian wispiness of the style. However, what is very obvious here is that Clint is moving towards the symbolism that is prevalent across Europe in the 1890s. If we look into the ether, uh, we can see a beautiful female face. It already looks rather like Adele Blockbauer. And then there's a, an ingenue, an innocent young child. And then on this side, we have all these hags. They look like they are the witches, don't they, from Macbeth. And he loves this idea of good and bad women, and uh, women who appear to be beautiful, but who are, their beauty is only skin deep. And then below the surface, you will find uh, ugliness and the hag. Or also, of course, this idea that beauty itself is uh, transient. So the dreamlike quality of this painting, the kiss, also seems to allude to the sort of Freudian idea of the subconscious. And it might also already relate to the, the kiss uh, Rodin's Kiss is, is 1888, so it's earlier, but it may also allude to the story of Paolo and Francesca because they are doomed lovers, brother and sister-in-law kiss, and then both are condemned to purgatory. So in terms of his relationships with women, and they are, com they are complicated, there are two levels uh, to Clint's, or three levels, in fact, to Clint's love life. Um, Emily is there all the time in the background as his friend and constant companion and his helpmate uh, in life. But he appears to have uh, relationships with many of the women that he portrayed. And this is Sonia, uh, Baroness Potier de Echelle, it's a wonderful name, uh, who was the wife of uh, Anton Knipp, so part of this um, elite in industrial society in uh, Vienna 
who were really Clint's main patrons. And there's even an idea that he had some sort of affair with her. Um, because remember, the, the gold standard was that once you married, women actually acquired a certain amount of independence. As long as they produced an heir and a spare and did not disgrace the family, uh, as long as they were discreet, they were rather allowed to, to go their own way. And the reason why we're, we're not sure if the relationship between Klimt and Sonia went deeper is this little red book that she's holding um, in the portrait of Sonia. Uh, it appears to be the private gift from Klimt to Sonia, and within it there are little, little sketches and drawings. And as you can see, her portrayal in the uh, painting is very much again in the Whistlerian style. And you can just see she's here dressed in a secession style, more of a reformed dress in a minute, but she's dressed very much in the avant-garde secession style, loose flowing robes, no uh, corsets. And above her head, you can see fruit trees of 1901, one of the Klimt's that she owns. And so another painting that shows this transition from the old Klimt to the new Klimt is music number one of 1895. Now we only have preparatory works for these two. Sop Reporter, they were designed for a music room. But one shows Liszt at the piano, and this one in a sort of Greco-Roman style is simply entitled Music. The originals were destroyed in the fire at Immendorf. During the war, many of Klimt's most famous paintings were sent to the castle of Immendorf to keep them safe. Unfortunately, right at the end of the war, uh, the uh, castle was set ablaze and we lost at least 20 of the most important works by Gustav Klimt, including uh, music number one. So we only know music number one and the uh, list at the piano from preparatory studies. So we've, we now come to the critical moments in Klimt's life, which is the secession itself. Uh, the official walkout in 1897. And I suppose really we have a couple of paintings, Palace Athena and Nuda Veritas, which we can sort of take as his manifesto. And uh, I've already shown that the theme of Palace Athena is something that he picked up very early on to represent this idea of a rebellion. We've got this younger, well, <laughs> younger generation under Gustav Klimt who are rebelling against the commercialization of the Viennese art world. So if you look in the background here, there's some sort of battle going on uh, between good and evil. And then we have Pallas Athena herself. The frame, by the way, is by the third brother, uh, Georg. Uh, it's beaten metal, as you can see, and extends the picture beyond the frame. And then Pallas Athena's uh, mask is the Gorgon. It's the head of Medusa, which will obviously turn you to stone when you go into battle. But she's holding in her hand. Originally, uh, uh, Pallas Athena holds victory. But now, Pallas Athena is holding naked truth. So my close-up here is of, the, of Minerva outside the Parliament building in Vienna. And here's my close-up showing you that traditionally Minerva holds a winged victory. And you might also notice the sphinx on her helmet to represent universal wisdom. These are all themes particularly popular in the decadence of the 1890s. This idea of Minerva, goddess of wisdom, you know, is encapsulated in the theme of the Sphinx. But the concept of triumph is turned by Klimt into his manifesto, Nuda Veritas. This very important painting is in fact in the Theatre Museum in Vienna. And it has this famous inscription along the top, if you can't please everybody with your deeds and your art, please only few, to please many is bad. So this is basically saying that you cannot produce a painting with the intention of pleasing the masses because it takes a level of sophistication, let's be honest, to understand and appreciate a work by Gustav Klimt. They're not easy. As uh, Oscar Wilde said, paintings are all surface and you go below that surface at your own peril. And that's particularly true, I think, of Gustav Klimt's works. They often look ravishing, beautiful on the surface, 
But when you go beneath that surface, you find sometimes find something that you're not so keen on. So Yuda Veritas is holding up here a mirror to society. It's the duty of the artist to reflect contemporary society, all the issues of the day, particularly themes like the new woman. And like I've said already, uh, Klimt is very much a product of Viennese psychoanalytic thought around the turn of the century. And that theme of the artist being true unto himself, being an individual, uh, following his own path, regardless of popularity or regardless of commercial success, is encapsulated in the secession building itself, which dates to 1898, and is by Josef Maria Olbrecht. It's in famous inscription to every age it's art, to art its freedom, is highlighting that, you know, that these artists are on a mission. Their mission was to represent the world as they see it. They have their own avant-garde magazine, The Sacrum, or The Sacred Spring, as it was described at the time. And the magazine itself, again, was a place where they could express their ideas. It was, again, a platform, a manifesto. As you enter the temple-like building, there are three heads. So they are the heads of the Gorgons. So they are the sisters of Medusa. And they represent painting, architecture and sculpture, the major arts. Josef Maria Olbrecht will leave Vienna in 1899 and take these avant-garde ideas to Darmstadt. So the first secession poster, uh, in fact, the first secession exhibition is not held in the secession building. It hadn't yet uh, been finished. But this is the first poster of 1898, and it absolutely scandalized Viennese society. The censors would not have this image of a naked, uh, athletic Theseus uh, fighting the Minotaur. Again, it's a manifesto. So Theseus is fighting the, man, uh, the Minotaur that represents a bourgeois complacency and essentially the sort of bourgeois uh, idea of, of, uh, of not embracing progress, of keeping the status quo. And so Klimt uh, is made to adjust on his poster rather amusingly by having trees, as you can see here, growing over the offending items of uh, Theseus's physique. And again, the important thing here is uh, Minerva on the side with that giant Medusa face on her shield. It wasn't just that the secession was going to showcase progressive Austrian art. Uh, the avant-garde artists of the day wanted to see what was going on throughout Europe. So it becomes a showcase for the avant-garde through a series of remarkable exhibitions. Ferdinand Holtler, who is from Switzerland, and is again at the forefront of this symbolist movement. This is a painting uh, based on his wife entitled Emotion. It's now in the Belvedere collection. And this is this idea of woman as a positive force. Ruskin rather succinctly describes women um, as two types, those that destroy men and those that make men, a, a bit like Emily Floger and Gustav Klimt. So this is woman in a positive sense, the embodiment of nature, the desire for harmony and fulfillment. Whereas Ferdinand Knopf, who was a very famous Belgian symbolist, um, his, his sculpture of Vivian, also in the Belvedere, represents the flip side. This is woman as witch, as sorceress, as destroyer of man. And this sort of idea that you can basically cut women, cut women into two very obviously diametrically opposed types can also be traced back to the pre-Raphaelites, particularly to Rossetti, who very much like to paint good women and bad women. Perhaps it goes back to Chaucer, ultimately, um, his uh, good women. The Eighth Secession exhibition was particularly important for Klimt's development, because this was when Charles William Mackintosh and his wife, Margaret MacDonald Mackintosh, uh, showed in Vienna. So this was the back end of 1900, uh, we know that the Mackintoshes stayed in Vienna for about five weeks, for the whole of November. They met many of those involved with the secession, particularly Colin and Moser and Josef Hoffman. 
And it would be true to say that uh, Vienna was completely won over to the Glasgow style. You can see a photograph at the bottom of their installation. Uh, MMM is Margaret MacDonald Macintosh. That was her May Queen. So when we come to look at Gustav Klimt's Beethoven frieze, you can see some obvious echoes of these plaster or gesso panels and friezes uh, by Margaret. And there's the mirror and there's the chair. So that's the Argyle Street chair. And that's the famous mirror, which is now in the Macintosh house um, in the Hunterian. They were able to secure, this is the Macintoshes, a very prestigious uh, commission from Fritz of Warndorfer, again, one of our Jewish haute bourgeois, and the main backer initially of the Wiener Werkstätte, founded in 1903. And uh, rather like uh, Morris and Co., the Wiener Werkstätte offered an entire interior decorating service. It was run by a consortium of artists, but they were all working in a very similar style. That's the Wiener Werkstätte, founded in 1903. This is the music room uh, that uh, the Macintoshes uh, designed for Fritz Warndorfer. The famous chair, which I'm going to make pop up for you in a minute. Well, there's the table. Hang on, so let me just go back quickly. There's the table, very odd with eight legs. Here it is, lacquered in white and with inserts of stained glass. I should really say leaded glass. Here, uh, so there's the table, sorry. And here's the chair, which you can't move away from the wall because it tips backwards and is not very practical on another level because that's hand painted silk. And then between 1904 and 1907, Margaret painted this absolute one. In fact, it's one of these gesso or plaster panels painted, uh, created by Margaret for the music room on the theme of the seven princesses. If you've ever been to visit the Mac, you'll know that this um, is proudly hanging on the wall today. It's extremely large, by the way, um, about 12, 18 feet in length, a lot long. That's the important thing. A, a very impressive work is what I'm trying to explain on, on a main monumental scale. So uh, Klimt is very much part, therefore, of this entire alternative culture the secession. Around 1898 to 1905, we have a series of iconic buildings, which all seem, again, to um, privilege or to emphasize the use of gold, perhaps, again, helping us to understand Glimp's golden phase. So I'm showing you the golden sunflowers on the Karlskirche, or in fact, subway station, uh, designed by Wagner and Ulbricht. Down the bottom, the golden medallions designed by Colman Moser, but they're on a building uh, by Otto Wagner. And the amazing four angels that look out over the city of Vienna on the beautiful uh, St. Leopold am Steinhof. So you'll see these now um, in greater detail. So here is the subway station on the Karlsplatz. So there are the sunflowers. Dates to 1898, and we think much of the decoration was actually conceived by Josef Maria Albrecht. The amazing private subway station uh, created for the Emperor Franz Josef at Schönbrunn was, I'm afraid, never completed. So the drawing is showing you how the dome was supposed to be finished. But nevertheless, it's still worth visiting. Not so much, perhaps, well, in fact, the outside is, is, is interesting, but it's the inside that's so magnificent as it shows you the concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which was very much how the secession artists conceived architecture. They wanted buildings to be totally in harmony. Architects were no longer constrained to just simply the bricks and mortar. They could design the entire interior, a la Macintosh. Uh, so here, the entire ensemble is conceived by Otto Wagner and Josef Maria Olbrecht. Uh, Karl Moll supplied the painting, which is the double Habsburg eagles flying over Schönbrunn. The carpet has been recently rewoven and matches the cheese plants, which are the theme of the silk hangings on the wall, and which tip over into the beautiful acid-etched windows and skylight. So it's a classic total harmony, or Gesamtkunstwerk. So I showed you the uh, golden house, as it's sometimes referred to. 
It's next. You can just pat my make out in the corner, the Mayolica house, but I'm sticking to my golden theme here. And so again, I, I highlighted the medallions, which um, each medallion has a separate meaning. So they sort of represent uh, virtues. They're almost like the muses. They've got triumphant palms coming out of them. And we've got those amazing women on the top here uh, shouting out the triumph of art over the city of Vienna. Uh, the building is by Otto Wagner, but the medallions are by Colin and Moser. And then uh, the Church of St. Leopold, or Amsteinhof, as it's usually affectionately known, those four angels of the apocalypse looking out over the city, and St. Stephen and St. Leopold, the patron saints, looking down from the roof. The, the secession building is often referred to as the golden cabbage. It's actually a giant laurel tree. Uh, coming out of the secession building. The dome here is often referred to as the golden lemon. And it was, uh, to mark the millennium, it was completely uh, refurbished. And it's again a, a good example of the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk. The wonderful mosaic windows in a very Burne Jonesian style, I think you'll agree, um, by um, Colum and Moser. And uh, they show, as you can see, we're looking here at the seven saints fulfilling Christ's commands uh, on earth to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, etc. And they're all holding their attributes. I particularly like St. Martin um, in the middle. And then the angels to either side, they're all looking down towards earth. And the two angels at the top here are holding the Veronica. So this sort of represents earthly side of devotion. And the flip side, the other window on the other side of the church, uh, represents uh, the seven spiritual commands. The high altar, the mosaic here is by Gamayas Romiling, not by Coleman Moser, because unfortunately he lost the commission because he converted from Roman Catholic to Protestant in order to marry. But mosaic is very important in our story, particularly after 1903, which is the year that Gustav Klimt visits Vienna. The wonderful Baldacchino, or Baldacchino here, it's by Othmar Schenkovich. And uh, my reason for, it, again, including it here is just to emphasize the theme of gold and also this interest in ancient art, Egyptian and Assyrian, as opposed to uh, Greco-Roman. And then again, before we leave the magnificent, all these golden halos here, before we leave uh, the mosaic, again, it's showing um, Christ enthroned and all the saints to either side. Um, one of them is here, St. Elizabeth of Hungary holding her roses. So here is Othmar Schenkovich's fantastic foundation in close-up. It mixed media, uses lots of different materials, enamel, uh, aluminium, uh, gold, but it's the flattening of the motifs, the incredible surface patterning, the patterns themselves, the combination of squares, triangles, geometric forms, what looks like an abacus just here, these all seem to spill over into Klimt's paintings because whilst this, this project, Am Steinhoff, is completed in 1907, uh, which was the year that Klimt uh, completed The Kiss. But whilst, in fact, uh, Otto Wagner was working on Am Steinhoff, uh, Klimt was embroiled in the first of several major scandals. So these are the mural decorations for the Vienna University, which he worked on between 1900 and 1907. Now, when this commission was given to Gustav Klimt, he was um, still thought of as part of the company of artists. His brother had uh, died, but Franz Natch and um, Klimt were still working in a sort of loose uh, confederation. So when these paintings were presented, to the public, um, they were not too pleased. They were not what they expected at all. They were expecting something in that very sort of neoclassical Albert Adamer style. So medicine, uh, I'm showing you here a close-up of Hygiena with the snake coming into to her bowl to represent, of course, the theme of Asclepius. And we have the study for it here on the right-hand side. But these uh, are works which were lost in the great fire of Immendorf. So we only know them from these preparatory sketches and also from black and white photographs. So this is the, uh, from the photograph and it's the finished image of Hygiena, 
with the hag, as you can see in the background. And on this side, the theme throughout all three paintings is this skein of life. And out of this skein of life appears to be a woman who sort of comes out of this and then back in again, uh, pulled by a man. And this, of course, with the skull is death. So here are the three uh, controversial paintings. Uh, they, uh, originally, they were a, a state commission and uh, Clint was paid for them. He had to pay back the advance when they were rejected and they will eventually be bought uh, by the Lederer family who were... Uh, uh, one of his most important patrons um, in Vienna. So philosophy, medicine, and jurisprudence. So here is philosophy and is the Sphinx that I pointed out earlier. These are the um, Athena Minerva, one of her attributes. But, you know, this was not the philosophy that they were expecting. They were some, expecting something nowhere near as nebulous and problematic as this. Medicine was in the middle with, again, this skein of humanity. Here's my woman. She's actually standing on a, a sort of a womb with a fetus inside it. She sort of comes out of the skein of life and then back in again. And then they were particularly upset by jurisprudence, uh, the law. So we've got uh, the law in the background, liberty, equality and all the rest of it. Um, but here is our victim, the guy who is being tried and apparently being eaten by a giant octopus. And these young ladies here are the Furies. So again, this is not the sort of image uh, that they expected. In fairness to the commission, which was for the ceiling of the entrance to the university, they would not work, have worked well as ceiling paintings. They were very much designed to be panel paintings, to be seen from one direction. Good ceiling paintings should be seen from multiple areas. And they didn't sit well either with the uh, central panel, uh, which is the triumph of the arts, as you can see, uh, by Franz Match. So it's not surprising that the paintings were rejected. We then sort of enter a period of hostility between Klimt and the public. A good example of that is this painting, simply entitled Goldfish, in which the beautiful Hilda Roth uh, from Bohemia appears to be mooning the public and looking back at you uh, with a rather mischievous uh, smile. She's actually based on this work by Aubrey Beardsley. Klimt was very familiar with the work of Aubrey Beardsley, as several of his patrons were, patrons were avid collectors. Uh, this is from one of his later, much more overtly, I think i fair to say, pornographic works. And you are not, therefore, just, I suppose, to imagine that Hilda is mooning, she's also doing something much more noxious, as you can see. And, um, and there's also, as you can see here, the, the, pot, you know, the, the, the pot of urine being thrown over again. Imagine this is Clint taking his revenge on all of those who have condemned his university paintings. So there's a lot of Beardsley going on in Clint's work. As you can see here immediately, so fish blood, which was one of the um, illustrations for the sacrum, is matched by work by Aubrey Beardsley, uh, which is one of the three water, water nymphs from the Rhine Maiden, as in Wagner. They're all into Wagner. Remember, this is the age of Mahler as well. So this is the Volglinde. And the um, Moser image, here, so this is by um, a column of Moser, you can see again is actually based on this theme of the three water nymphs from the Rhine Maiden. But again, that goldfish is coming in. So the fish blood, these are very complex paintings, or I should say graphic art. There is a painted version of it as well. You know, what is Clint's message here? Is this sort of some sort of primordial uh, fluid that our women are swimming through? Is it some reference to, to blood? Literally, remember that in 1897, the famous horror story Dracula was published. So women were often described as a poison in the blood. Or could it even be seminal fluid that they're swimming through? A sort of reference to uh, rebirth, regeneration. We're on the cusp, of course, of the new century, the fin of the fin de siècle. So these paintings, or I should say in this case, graphic arts, are to be read at different levels, at a purely decorative level, or again, going below the surface to try and understand their uh, complex message. 
and the beardskin, of course, of course, is directly related uh, to the Rhine maidens who, remember, sang and um, sort of lured you uh, to, to your doom. So we're back to the fan for town. So we have quite a few of these women who appear to be water serpents so mermaids or white fish again look rather like sperm and they well have been inspired by the famous frame of Edvard Munch's painting uh, which is usually known as the virgin or the madonna or the woman because of course uh, the mother theme because we have as you can see here the fetus at the bottom and then the sperm swimming all the way around the outside of the frame and this is quite a bit earlier in date it dates to 1893 and is part of Edvard Munch's great uh, theme of life and then Serpents One is also known as Girlfriends he again seems to be fascinated by let me be frank, he seems to be fascinated by lesbian relationships. So you'll often get uh, you know, two women, as you can see here in Mermaids and Girlfriends, an intimacy between the women. But again, it's quite difficult to unpick in terms of his message. And certainly in the case of Serpents One, it has some dark themes in it, uh, which it, you know, its beauty rather obscures. So you can see here there's a fish, but then there's a sort of giant serpent uh, weaving its way up the background. And we'll come to this theme of girlfriends later on. It's also a very important theme uh, for Egon Schiele. It's reprised here in Water Serpents of 1904, where again, there's the eye of the serpent. We have the group of women. They appear to, gain, to be in this sort of primordial soup. Some of them are looking directly at the spectator in a very evocative or provocative femme fatale uh, type of way. And, you know, you can see that all of these themes are sort of coming together um, in Clint's at work. This idea that the beautiful surfaces conceal a darker message. And these themes certainly come to a head um, in the Beethoven frieze itself, which dates to 1902, and where you can see the obvious influence of uh, Margaret MacDonald Macintosh, and for that matter, Charles Rennie, on Clint's thinking. 